Okay, so we've talked about the theory behind regression discontinuity. We've talked about how to actually measure the gap um, at the threshold or at the cutoff. And we've talked about some of the main concerns we have to, th to think about when we do this analysis. So now we're actually going to do it with R. Um, so this should be fun. We'll use this AIG example that we've been talking about throughout these different videos. Um, so what we're going to do, um, just to give a roadmap of what we're going to do in the analysis, um, we're going to start off by checking to see if uh, the assignment to our treatment or our program is rule-based. And if it is, then we can continue and we can do regression discontinuity. If it's not, then we can't. Um, the only way this works is if you have some sort of arbitrary rule that decides if somebody can access the program. Um, then we have to determine if the assignment to treatment is fuzzy or sharp. Um, either one works. Um, there are ways to do fuzzy analysis or sharp analysis. Sharp is easier because you can just use regular regression. You, can, um, you don't have to worry about compliers and non-compliers. Um, in the example that we're going to do, it's sharp. Um, in your problem set, it's sharp. In, your, um, um, in exam two, it will be sharp. Um, I'm keeping everything as easy as possible. If you start doing this stuff in real life and you see that it's fuzzy, um, email me, look at the documentation, Google stuff. Um, I can, you'll find lots of resources to help you with fuzzy analysis. Um, then we're going to see if there's a discontinuity in the running variable at the cut point, and we don't want to see that here. This is the McCrary test. We want to see, uh, we don't want to see any manipulation in the test score to see if there's a whole bunch of people at 75 or 76 that shouldn't be there um, compared to 74. It needs to be nice and smooth. Um, then we want to check to see if there's a discontinuity in the outcome. So this is that final test score that we've been using. And that's where we want to actually do see a, a, a discontinuity. We want to see that delta, that size of the gap. And if we can see that, then we have a causal effect. And then we're going to measure how big that gap is. And we're going to measure it a whole bunch of different ways and figure out how big it is in real life. There's no true value of the gap because it really all depends on how you draw the lines. And there's no true way to draw the lines. We'll just draw a ton of different lines, get a whole bunch of different measures of the gap size, and we'll see how big it potentially is. So let's do this. All right, so go ahead and download the um, zip file that is posted on the class website for today. Um, or you can go to the RStudio Cloud project that's there, um, and it should load everything and have um, all the data and our markdown files in the correct locations. Um, if you download the zip file, make sure you unzip it, and then open the rproj file so you can open a project. Um, and so your screen should look something like this um, after you open the AIG program.rmd file. Um, so go ahead and do that. You can go ahead and you can also click on AIG program finished. Um, and that is the finished version of all the analysis um, that's there for your reference. Um, it's also pretty identical to what is on the class website um, that is on the actual website. And so you can have access to it there or here. Um, you can run it a whole bunch of different places. Um, but what we care about is aigprogram.rmd, because this one, if you scroll through it, is pretty empty. It just has a bunch of chunks with no code in it, um, in them. So we're going to add all of the code and start doing the analysis. Um, and so this, again, is based on this idea that students the hypothetical students take a test in sixth grade to determine if they can get into this academically and intellectually gifted program, or AIG. And then um, if they do the AIG program, they might have higher test scores at the end of their high school experience. Um, and so there's some final mythical hypothetical test that they take at the end of high school um, that's based on a score of 100. And so uh, what we want to see is, does this AIG program boost test scores at the end of school. Again, this is all fake. Um, it's just data that we can play with. Um, so if you look at this first chunk here named settings, it just has some um, settings. You've seen this in other examples before. Um, we're going to use the Huxtable package to show side-by-side -side regression tables. Um, but one thing that Huxtable likes to do when you knit is it reformats all of your tables to be shaded differently and have borders and stuff. And I don't like that. Um, and so if you run this options um, line right here, that will turn off the fancy formatting that Huxtable does. 
Um, and then right here, this just makes it so all of the figures that we make will be the same width and height, and they'll all be centered. And retina means there'll be double resolution. So if you have a fancy MacBook or a fancy Windows machine that has a, a good screen on it, they'll look nice and, and clear. Again, this stuff I've been copying and pasting from document to document all the time. Um, I have no idea how to type this by hand, especially this Huxtable printing thing. I found that on the internet once and I've just been using that same line ever since. So don't feel bad about copying and pasting. Um, so you can go ahead and run this chunk. Um, it's not gonna do much, but it'll still run. Um, if you look at the next chunk, this is where we start loading the libraries. We're going to use tidyverse so that we can plot things and manipulate our data frames like we've been doing before. We're going to use broom, which lets us convert models like from LM into data frames and we can do nice things with them. Um, the two new packages that we're going to be using are RD robust and RD density. This lets us do regression discontinuity stuff. Um, Non-parametric regression, regression discontinuity, or this package lets us get the McCrary density tests. Um, and then we'll also load this Huxtable library so we can get the side-by-side -side regression tables. And then this last line loads the data and so that we can um, have this AIG program data to work with. Um, so go ahead and run this chunk, and you'll see that you'll have a data frame over in your environment panel named AIG program. And if you click on that, you can see um, all of our fake data. We have their test score for getting into the AIG program. We have their final test score. We have some demographics and we have whether or not they are in the AIG program um, and an ID column. So those are the main things we care about. The only columns we're going to really work with are test score, final score, and AIG. Um, if we want, we can control for other demographics in the models, but we don't need to. Um, these were just randomly assigned anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So if you go back to your markdown file, we're going to go through those same steps that we looked at in the PowerPoint at the beginning of this video. So first we want to determine if the process of assigning treatment was rule-based. And there's no statsy way to do this. We can't look at the data, the data set and see if it was rule-based. We just have to know about the program. And because we made up this program and we know that there was a 75 point threshold, um, we can say that it was rule-based. So we can actually just type that here. Yep. It was rule-based. Um, in real life, you would explain why it's rule-based and how it was assigned and what the arbitrary threshold is and all sorts of stuff. Um, but because we made up this data, we'll just say, yay. All right, so step two. This is where we want to determine if the uh, assignment to treatment was fuzzy or sharp. We want to see if people who scored above 75 didn't get into the program or if people below 75 did get into the program. Um, because ideally we want it to be nice and sharp with no non-compliers on either side. So we can check this graphically and we can check it with numbers. We can count how many people uh, scored higher than 75 and didn't get in the program and vice versa. Um, so we're going to first plot this. Um, so we're going to plot two variables. We want the running variable, which is our test score. And then we want to have AIG, whether or not they were in the program, on the y-axis. And so this should show, hopefully, we'll have a nice clean break where people below 75 were not in the program, people above 75 were in the program. So if we come to this chunk, we can start plotting. So we'll go ggplot. Our data is AIG program. And then our mapping is going to be, so we say AES for aesthetics. We're going to say X is equal to, I can't remember the name of the column, it was test score. So X equals test score. Y equals AIG. And we'll also color the dots by AIG, by whether or not they were in the program, so we can see it better. Um, we want to show this, if we ran this right now, we'd see an empty plot. So we want to show this um, with points. So we'll say geom underscore point. And let's go ahead and run that just so we can see what the preliminary plot looks like. There we go. We have a whole bunch of uh, red dots and a whole bunch of turquoise dots. Um, and so that shows a pretty good discontinuity right there at 75. 
Um, one thing we can do to help see that actual cutoff is we can add a line at 75 so that it's clearer. Um, so that's just adding another geom. So after geom point, you can say geom underscore v line or vertical line. And the way we tell it to be at exactly 75 is we say x intercept equals 75. So go ahead and run that chunk again, and you'll see a nice line there at 75. Um, we have some issues with overplotting. We just have like these solid lines here. Those aren't actually lines. They're a whole bunch of dots on top of each other. Um, so one thing we can do to fix that is add some transparency. We can say alpha equals 0 0.5. So they're 50% transparent. So if you do that, you'll see it's still pretty heavy there. Um, some semi-transparent things out there, so we could shrink it even more, alpha equals 0.1. It's still pretty heavy there. So another thing we can do is we can jitter those things. Um, we can shift them around. Um, we can specifically shift them up and down. They don't need to, like, we don't care if they're a little bit more true or a little bit less true. Um, they can go up and down here. We don't want to jitter them side to side because we don't want somebody at 80 being accidentally shifted to 85. So what we can do is inside G on point, we can say position equals, and there's a special jitter function called position underscore jitter. And what we can do is tell it how much to jitter width wise. So we can say width equals zero because we don't want th these dots to randomly go side to side. And we can say height equals something, maybe 0.3. So they'll go up and down randomly within 0.3. So go ahead and run that chunk. And there we go. So this shows kind of a good distribution of people. Nobody above 75 points on their test or nobody below 75 points in, on the test was true. Nobody above was false. It's a nice sharp discontinuity. Everything's happy there. Um, so we can actually check this numerically um, to see the exact count of people in um, these two different groups. We have a group of people. We have one grouping of whether or not they were in the program. And we have another grouping of whether or not they scored 75 points on the test. So what we can do is do some group by and summarize from dplyr. Um, to see the exact numbers. So if we say AIG program and then do a pipe sign, which is command shift M or control shift M, we're going to group by two things here. Group by. We're going to group by AIG and we're going to group by whether or not their test score is greater than or equal to 75. Okay, so now we have two different groups and then we're going to summarize. And we're going to get the count of people in each of those groups. And we'll just use the n function, which tells us how many rows there are in each of these invisible subgroups that it makes. So if we run this, we'll see um, that there were 350 people who were not in the AIG program um, who also did not score above 75. And there were 600 people who were in the AIG program who did score above 75. And importantly, there are zero people who were in the program and didn't score high enough or were not in the program and did score high enough. Um, so nice and sharp, everything's great there. Okay, step three, we want to check for a discontinuity in the running variable. Um, we don't want to see that because again, this is the manipulation. We don't want to see a whole bunch of people scoring 75 or 76 or not enough people scoring 74. We don't want there to be manipulation in the test score to get people into the program or not. Um, so what we can do is check this a couple different ways. Um, one easy way is we can draw a histogram of our distribution of test scores and see if it looks weird at the cutoff to see if there's more people um, in the program or out of the program. So we'll make a histogram with ggplot. We're going to say data equals AIG program. And we're going to mapping equals, so we're going to map the x axis to our test score column. And then we're going to say geom histogram. And if we just do this by itself, it's going to automatically do 30 bins. 
um, we want to, to set our own bin width here. Um, so we might want to do a bin width of two so that um, what we have is every, um, every one of those columns represents two points on the test. And let's see what that looks like. Run that chunk. Neat. Um, one thing we can do is fill this, fill the, the bars, by whether or not they scored, in, scored 75. Or because we know it's a sharp discontinuity, we can fill it by whether or not they were in the program. So we'll fill by AIG. So if we plot that now, so you can see that this section of the distribution was not in the program, this section was in the program. And we can add a line for our cutoff again. I'm using geom v line, and then x intercept equals 75. So there is our nice line right there at 75. And one last thing we can do to the histogram is if you add a color to it, like color equals white, that'll add a small border around each of the bars, and so it's easier to see kind of um, the two point chunks you have here. Um, so what we care about is the bars, these histogram bars, right before and right after the cut point. Um, it looks at first glance that we might have too many people on this side, uh, on the program side of the cutoff, compared to the non-program side of the cutoff. Um, if this was perfectly smooth, you might have more people um, scoring 74 than over here scoring 76. So that might be something to worry about, but we don't have any statistical measure of that. We don't know if that's a significant jump, if that's something we need to worry about, if that's just because of chance. Um, so we can't just draw a histogram and, and call it good. We need to run kind of a more systematic test. And so that's where we can do the uh, McCrary density test. So the way we do that, because we've loaded the, the RD density package, there is a function called RD density, RD, no, RD plot density. And this lets us um, do the official McCrary test to see if it's statistically significantly different at that boundary. Um, the syntax for this is kind of weird. The authors of these regression discontinuity packages didn't write the packages to fit within the tidyverse world. And so things are not easily pipeable. Um, it's, it's hard to, to deal with the plots that get spat out of them. You have to do some kind of older R stuff, standard base R. Um, and so the syntax is weird. And so again, you have this for reference. You don't need to memorize it. Um, so the way this works is we have to give RD plot density, the function, um, a regression discontinuity object, which is our um, running variable. So it's this argument called RDD. And so we say RDD equals, and there's a function called RD density. And you just have to memorize this or look at the documentation for RD plot density. There's no easy way to remember all of this. Um, so what we do with RD density is we have to feed it our running variable, which is capital X. So this is our AIG program. Um, and the way we do this is we have to give it a specific column inside AIG program. And this is kind of the base R way of doing this. So we type the, the data frame name, and then we do a dollar sign. And this is the regular R way of finding a column inside a data frame. And so you notice once we hit the dollar sign, it, it gave us this pop-up menu. And so we can choose test score, because that's our running variable. And so that's the thing we care about. Um, then we need to tell it what the cutoff is. So we can say C, lowercase c, because that's what it says in the help file, equals 75, because that's our cutoff for the running variable. And then after, so in between these two parentheses, so outside of RD density, but still inside RD plot density, we'll hit a, do a comma and then press enter. And then because it's a strange function, we have to tell it the running variable again with capital X. But this time we don't use RD density. We just say AIG program dollar sign test score. And if we do that and run this chunk, we should see a plot. We actually see two plots, which is another kind of annoying thing that happens with RD plot density. Um, it spits out the plot twice. 
Um, so one way around that is you can actually assign the output of this, this function to some variable and store it there, and one of those plots will get stored there. The other one won't. The other one will just get spat out because it does. And again, that's kind of annoying, but that's just what it does. Um, so we can just say like ASDF or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. We're just sticking the results of this thing so that it doesn't make two plots. So if we run this function again, now we just have one plot. And if we look at that, there is a gap um, between that black line and that red line, but it's not statistically significant. Those confidence, over, uh, confidence intervals overlap. It's not something we need to worry about. And so we can check off step three. There's not a discontinuity in the running variable at the cut point. So we can move on and we're good. So next, we need to measure the size of that gap officially. Um, but we want to see if there really is a gap. Um, so again, we're going to make another plot. And this is going to be the running variable, our test score, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it's going to be our outcome variable, or the final test score that they take at the end of high school. So we're going to make another plot with ggplot. Our data, once again, is AIG program. Our mapping with our aesthetics. Um, we have x is our running variable. I forgot the name of it. Test score. So test score. Our outcome is y, which is called final score. I probably should have named these better. Oh well. Final score. And then, just to make the graph easier to follow, we're going to color each of those points by whether or not they were in the program. So we're going to color by AIG. Um, we want to add some points. So we're going to say geom point. And let's go ahead and run that and see what it looks like. Hey. So we have a scatter plot. Um, there seems to be a, a jump here at 75-ish. Um, we have some overplotting. Some of these points are big. They're overlapping each other. Um, we can fix that by shrinking the points. We can say size equals 0.5, alpha equals 0.5, sure. Um, if we run that, we should have smaller, more transparent dots. Cool. Um, we want to see the actual um, line uh, for the cutoff. So we can say geom v line x intercept equals 75. And there is our line. Um, just for fun, if you want to make it dotted, you can say line type equals dotted. And now you have a dotted cutoff line. Or you can say dashed. And now it's a dashed line. Um, the last thing we want to do is add a, a best fit line um, that goes on the red side and then goes on the blue side because we want to again get the the size of that gap so the easiest way to do that is to use geom smooth and if you just do regular geom smooth it's going to do a non-parametric low s curve it even tells you it's using low s um, and so you can see it's kind of curvy it wiggles around we don't want that right now we just want a nice straight line and so inside geom smooth we can say method equals LM. So it's going to use a linear model. So now if we run it, there's our nice linear model um, for the regression discontinuity. So what we care about now is we have a gap. It looks like it's statistically significant, but we want to measure how big that gap is. Um, how many points does this AIG program boost your final score? Um, so we need to measure it, and that gets us to step five. Um, so we're going to measure it both parametrically and non-parametrically. So we're going to use a low S curve and kind of make a wiggly line and then figure out how big the gap is. But first we're going to use regular regression. Um, we don't need to add any squared coefficients or cubed coefficients because that looks pretty straight. Um, there's no weird curviness there. So we'll go ahead and do just a regular regression to figure out how big that gap is. Um, but if you remember from the PowerPoint, the easiest way to do this is to center um, our running variable. So instead of looking at the actual test score, we're looking at how many points above or below 75 people scored. Um, and then that's going to help us get the, the accurate size of that gap. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we'll make, us, we'll make a new data set based on AIG program where we're going to add a new column. So we're going to call this AIG centered. And this is going to equal AIG program. We'll add a pipe. And we're going to mutate. And we're going to say, we're going to make a new variable called test centered. And this is going to equal test score. So we'll say test score minus 75, because that was our cutoff. So if you run this, now we should have a second data set up here called AIG centered. If you look at it, it has all the same columns as before, but now it has a new column for test centered. So this person was 17 points above the threshold at 88. Um, oh, at 92, over there. Um, this person was two points under the threshold at 73-ish points. So that worked. Hooray. So what we're going to do is build a model using that new centered variable. So we'll just call it a super exciting name of model 1. And we're going to say LM. So here, what our outcome was, was final score. So we'll say final score is explained by test centered plus AIG. That's that indicator variable for whether or not they were in the program. That's the true or false variable. And then we need to say data equals AIG centered. And we want to see the results of this. We'll say tidy model underscore one. So if we run this now, here are our results. We have the intercept is 63. So like we said during the PowerPoint, that means um, that is what that is essentially where this red line is right at the cutoff. So somebody who scored like a 74.9 on their test on average would have a six, uh, final test score of 63 points. That's what that is showing there. Um, this test centered, that coefficient means every point you go up above the threshold, your final score goes up by half a point by 0.53 points. This last one, AIG true, that's the thing we care about the most. That is how big of a gap there is, or how big of a boost you get when AIG is true at the cutoff. And so you're going from 63-ish to whatever 63 plus 8 is, which I can't do the math for, but we'll use R. 63 plus 8 is 71. Whew. So people who scored 75 on the AIG test have an average final score of 71 compared to 63 for those who were not in the program. So that is the size of the gap, and that's good. And we can check if it's if it's statistically significant. The p-value is super tiny. Our t, our t statistic is big, so that's good. Um, cool. So another thing we can do. Right now, we're using the full width of the data. We're using everybody. Um, people who scored 30 on the test, people who scored 100 on the test, we haven't used any bandwidths yet. Um, but we want to limit our analysis to just kind of the people around that cutoff. So what we need to do is shrink it down um, when we run the models so that we're not looking at everybody um, to see if that changes the test score. So what we're going to do is make a couple new data frames. So if we come down to this next chunk, we'll make one data frame called AIG program 10 for a bandwidth of 10. And so we're just going to base this on AIG centered. And all we're doing here is we're going to filter it so that it only includes people where their centered test score is below 10 and above negative 10. So we're only looking at the people plus or minus 10. Um, so to do that, we can say test centered is greater than negative 10 and test centered is less than 10. So if you run that, you should have a new data set over here called AIG program 10. And if you look at it, test centered here, nobody should be above 10 or under negative 10. And if you look, we used to have 1,000 rows. Now we have 497 rows. So we threw away half our data. Um, we also want to make a data set for people plus or minus 5 in the bandwidth. So the easiest way to do this is just to copy our AIG program 10 and change it from 10 to 5. 
So we want test centered is greater than negative 5 and less than negative 5. And so if we run that, we should see a similar result. So now if we look at AIG program 5, nobody has a test centered score greater than 5 or less than negative 5. Now we're down to only 257 rows. We got rid of almost three-fourths of our data. Um, but we have very, very narrow bandwidths now, so that's good. Um, so now we want to run our models again, but this time using the, the bandwidth data. So the easiest way to do this is to come back up to model one and copy it, and we'll just change a few things. So if we come here, paste it, and paste it again. So we're going to make model two, or whatever you want to call it. It's still going to be predicting final score based on test centered plus AIG. But instead of using the full centered data, we're going to use the bandwidth of 10 data. And then we'll look at the results. And then we'll make model 3. And that's going to be the same thing. These don't change. The only thing that changes is the data set that we're using, which is AIG program 5. And then we want to look at the model results. So if you run that whole chunk, it will show two different models. So the first one is when you have a bandwidth of 10. Um, and notice how our coefficient is now 9 instead of 8. So if we're narrowing it down and just looking at plus or minus 10 on each side, the program effect seems bigger um, by a point. Um, if we look at the bandwidth of 5 and look at it even narrower, then the program effect shrinks. And now it's 7.3 instead of 8 or instead of 9. Um, which one of those is most accurate? I have no idea. Um, I don't know what the true program effect is um, because it's just fake data. Um, but notice how it, it changes. And so we can, another sensitivity, sensitivity analysis we could do is shrink it even more, make it even wider, use half of the bandwidth, twice the bandwidth, something, and see how much that changes um, to see if it ever drops below zero. Maybe it's a negative effect. Maybe it's a giant effect. Who knows? Um, so finally, we want to see all three of these parametric models at once. So the way we do this is we use the hux reg function, and we just feed it our three models. And we can actually name them to make it easier. So to name them, we can use list. So we're going to say name of the thing, so full data equals model 1. Um, bandwidth equals 10 was model 2. And bandwidth equals 5 was model 3. Wow, model 3. OK, and we'll put that on its own line. So here, we're just feeding it a list of models, but we're naming each of them. And so if you run this chunk, you'll see this side-by-side -side regression table here for the full data for when we have a bandwidth of 10 and when we have a bandwidth of 5. So you can see the, the effect changing from 8.4 to 9.2 to 7.4. Um, and you can see how much it changes. And there's some preliminary results for our gap with parametric models. Next, we want to do some non-parametric stuff um, and use the curvy lines um, instead of fitting exact straight lines to this. So to do the non-parametric stuff, we're not going to run any models. We're not going to worry about centering variables or anything. We can use our original data. Um, the function we use here is rd robust. And if you notice the pop-up thing here, there's a whole bunch of different arguments you can feed into it. Um, if you look at the help file for rd robust, you can read all about them. Um, the three most important things you need to feed it are the y, which is your outcome, the x, which is your running variable, and the c, which is the cutoff. And if we feed it just those three things, it should tell us the effect size or the size of that gap. Um, so we say y equals, and here we have to use the old style version, the standard R style version of giving a column name. So we say AIG program dollar sign. So our outcome is final score. We can say x equals, this is our running variable, which is AIG program dollar sign test score. And our cutoff was 75. 
Um, if we just run this, it will give us some output, but for whatever reason, it doesn't actually show us the size of the gap. It just shows us like diagnostic stuff. To see the size of the gap, we have to feed the results of this function into another function called summary. And then that will tell us the size of the gap. So if you add a pipe and then do summary, just like that, it should give us the size of the gap. OK. So it actually gives you a ton of information here. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, that's where the most important, that's the thing we care about, the, the coefficient for the conventional method for um, robust regression discontinuity that's non-parametric. It says it's 8. That's the size of the gap. We have a Z score for or a Z statistic for it. It's big and it's statistically significant. It gave us a confidence interval. Um, so it could be between 5 and 10 um, if we did it a whole bunch of times. Um, but that's definitely not zero, and so we can say it's statistically significant. It's big. If we scroll up to the top, it gives us a bit more information about how it actually calculated that effect size. So it says it started off with 1,000 observations. Um, it decided to use a triangular kernel because it did. Um, so again, that's giving tons of weight to the points that are right next to the cutoff and a lot less weight as you go further away. It's using this optimal bandwidth based on this MSERD algorithm decision. Um, if you look down here, it actually tells you what the bandwidth was. So it's using plus or minus 6.584 because that's what it decided was best. Um, you can actually feed your own bandwidth to it. One of the arguments to RD robust is whatever bandwidth you want. And so we could tell it to be 5. We could tell it to be 10. Um, it also tells you how many observations it's actually looking at. So it's actually only looking at 346 or even 138 that got treatment. Um, 654 with a wider band with um, a more robust bandwidth and then 198. And so that's, that's what all of this shows here. But again, kind of the most important final number you care about is that 8. Um, cool. So if we want to plot this, um, there's a built-in function um, with the RD robust package that will plot the, the difference or the size of that gap. Um, the easiest way to do it is to actually grab the code from RD robust because it has all the same arguments. The only thing that changes is the name of the function. So if you grab this, don't worry about the summary part. Copy RD robust, all of that stuff, down to here. And we'll change RD robust to RD plot for regression discontinuity plot. And everything else is the same. We can re-indent this just to make things line up. If you select those lines and then press Control i or Command i it'll fix the indentation. And if you run that chunk, there's our regression discontinuity plot. Um, so you can see that there's a gap right there. The size of that gap is 8 points. These points here, one odd thing that the, the RD plot function does is these aren't actually the data points that are in the real data. Um, it essentially makes kind of a histogram. It bins these things. And so these are the average point, the average Y values for some specific bin. Um, and you can choose the bin width. And so it's kind of like a histogram, but a scatterplot version of histogram. So even if you had like a million points, you would still see just like 50 or however many you see here. Um, so that's not the actual data, those are just averages. But you can still see that 8-point increase there. Um, so the bandwidth, the way, so we saw that it chose this bandwidth up here, this MSERD, that's based on mean standard error, trying to, find, to minimize the mean standard error, that's the algorithm it's doing. Um, but we can look at a whole bunch of different algorithms and see what potentially it could choose. So that we know is the best one. Um, but what you can do is you can use a function called RD bandwidth select, and it'll tell you a whole bunch of different ones. And it uses the same syntax as RD robust again. So if we copy that, and it's the same syntax as RD plot, we can come here to this next chunk and paste it. And we're going to use this function called RD BW select. And if we select these lines, press Command I or Control I, re-indent it. Um, this needs the summary because 
that's how they wrote this function. Um, if you run this chunk, you'll see um, it gives you one bandwidth. If you just give it, if you just run it like this without telling it to show a whole bunch of different bandwidths, that's just telling you what the optimal bandwidth is, um, 6.5. And this happens to be symmetrical. So it says 6.5 to the left of the cutoff, 6.5 to the right of the cutoff. Um, that's not always the case. Some of the optimal bandwidths might have a few on the left side and a bunch on the right side. It just depends on how the algorithm is trying to, to optimize stuff. Um, so that shows you the best bandwidth. You can also see all of the bandwidths. So if you, if you copy this code again, this rdbw select, and come to this next chunk that says rdbw select all, one of the arguments you can feed into it is comma all equals true. So if you run this, it'll actually show you all of the potential bandwidths that the that RD robust uses. Um, so if you look here, these are all the different ones that could potentially work um, for finding the size of that gap. It happened to choose the mean standard error one, but you can also have a whole bunch of different others, but they all range between like 4.5, 6-ish. They do have this one that's like 14 on one side and 6 on the other. Neat. Um, there might be situations where that's best. I don't know. Um, but again, generally, you just want to use whatever it tells you to use. If you don't want to use whatever it tells you to use, you can specify your own. Um, and the way you do that is you can add one more argument to RD Robust to give your own bandwidth instead of using whatever they automatically find for you. So if you scroll back up to the very first RD Robust, right here, let's copy that. And let's bring it down to here. And we'll paste it. So to specify your own bandwidth, for whatever reason, the argument is named H, which stands for bandwidth. Um, and so here we can just say, if we want plus or minus 5, we can say 5. Um, so if we go ahead and run that, this is the results when the bandwidth is 5. And so now we have 8.2. Neat. Um, something that's common to do, like we talked about during the PowerPoint, is to, you can do double the bandwidth and half the bandwidth to see how much it changes. So if we copy this and come down to, or we'll just do it in the same chunk here, paste this twice. So we'll do h equals 5 times 2. You could also just type 10, but you can have r do the math for you. And then we can say the bandwidth is 5 divided by 2, or 2.5. If you run each of these, if you run the whole chunk, you'll get three versions of it. And so when we use a bandwidth of 5, the size is 8.2. If we use a bandwidth of 10, the size is 8.5, so it didn't really change much. If we use a bandwidth of 2.5, the size is 8.2, which didn't really change much. So that's good. It shows that our results are pretty robust to different bandwidth sizes. We can shrink it, we can make it big, and it's generally going to be around 8.2-ish, uh, regardless of what we do. Um, the last thing we can do is we can manipulate the kernel. So right now it's using the triangular kernel. So again, giving lots of weight to the points right next to the, the cut point and less weight as you go out. Um, we can choose different kernels too. So go ahead and copy the rd robust function again. Um, so the way you do different kernels is it's another argument to rd robust. Um, so instead of specifying our own bandwidth, we'll just stick with whatever it chooses. It was the 6.5 something. Um, but we're going to change the kernel. So we're going to say kernel equals. And there are three possible kernels you can use. If you look at the help file for RD robust, so we can say RD robust. If you scroll down to kernel, which eventually is right there. There. So if you look up here, it says there are three possible kernels. You have the triangular, which is the default. You have Epinechnikov, which is that curvy one. 
So the points right by the cutoff are important, but not super important, and it kind of gradually lessens in importance. And you can use uniform. And so all of the points have the same importance all the way across. So we can say triangular, which is the default. We can copy this and say Epanech, I have no idea how to spell that, so we'll copy it from our help file, Epanechnikov. And then we'll copy this, and we'll do a uniform kernel. So if we run all three of these, so this is using the, the default bandwidth um, with different kernels. If we wanted to go super wild, we could have double bandwidth and half bandwidth for each of the different kernels, and we'd have like a billion different models. Um, but so far, everything's pretty consistent, no matter how big the bandwidth is. And I'm guessing the kernels are pretty consistent, too. So here's triangular. It's 8. Here's the Epinechnikov kernel, and it is 7.8. And here's the uniform kernel, and it is 7.7. .7. Um, so a little bit less when we change the kernel, but it's not dropping down to like 4 or 1 or going up to like 20. Um, it's generally within the range of 7, 8-ish. And so that's kind of the main effect. Um, so then the last step here is to compare all the effects. And so we can systematically go back and say, what was it when we did it parametrically? And we can write down what it was um, with each of the parametric models. And so we can write down 8.4, we can write down 7.3, write down... 8.4 again, and if we collect all of those in the end, we can have one big table that shows all of the different effects that we found. Um, if you look at the final finished R Markdown file and scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see that I did that. And so here's this, this fancy Markdown table that shows all of the different estimates with the different bandwidths and kernels and methods, and in the end, you just choose one of those estimates or choose all of them and say, here's all the potential program effects um, from this program. It ranges from 7.3 to 9. But in general, it looks like this AIG program does boost your final high school test score. And so we should probably roll it out because it's, it has a good strong effect. Um, you do need to remember that this is just for the local average treatment effect. And so it's not for the whole population, it's just for people in that bandwidth. Um, but for people in that bandwidth, it looks like this AIG program is effective and it's doing the good things and boosting scores. Um, and so that's how you do this regression discontinuity stuff with R. You just throw a whole bunch of different models at the data and see how consistent your estimates are. And that's how you do it.